Okay, we are at 7.03. And I know if we burn any more minutes on the front end, we're gonna pay for it on the back end. So why don't we go ahead and get, um, get started. First, I just wanna say a warm welcome to all of the people who are making time in their busy evenings to join us. I know we've got a number of students, parents, and alumni. And what is really great about this event is it's really the first time that Career Connections has been able to offer some of the programming in the evening, which allows for some of our alumni to join. So we're really pleased to have you. Thanks for joining. My name's Christine Dauenhauer, and I run the Career Connections program. And I want to just um, introduce a couple people who are on the call, and then I'm going to quickly turn it over to Bill and Scott Bagley. So um, a big, a big warm welcome and thank you to the group that made tonight possible. One is Lauren Cobble. She's in the College Advising Department at St. Xavier High School, and she's going to talk just a little bit tonight about the services that they offer. I'll be touching on the Career Connections program a little bit, and then truly behind the scenes, but doing a lot of heavy lifting were Gio Minghetti and Joseph Piowitz. So they are two students on our steering team, the Career Connections steering team. They did all of our marketing. They did a whole lot of the planning that went into not only tonight's session, but the full series. So um, thank you to Gio and Lauren and Joseph for bringing this to life with us. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Bill Bagley and Scott Bagley. So Bill and I met about a year ago, and this is really the culmination of the two of us sharing a passion for um, professional development and really skill building and thinking about personal action planning, even when you're in high school. So Bill's going to give you more detail on his background, but just know what you are getting a window into is essentially being taught at many universities around the country, as well as businesses when it comes to um, leadership development. So I'm thrilled, couldn't be happier to have Bill and Scott Bagley with us tonight. And I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you, Christine, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, Scott and I are very pleased to, to be facilitating this session tonight. I, I wanna say that St. X is one of the very few high schools in the nation is doing this kind of stuff. And you should feel grateful that you have the opportunity, not because Scott and I are presenting, but that because you're getting this type of preparation as you move on to college and in the business world. Scott and I have been working together for the last 15 years. I spent 40 years working with professionals and helping them become successful. Scott spent 30 years doing the same thing. We came together about 15 years ago to do this together. And our real focus is helping young professionals move out into the work world. So tonight, I'm going to go through a book that we published a few years ago in collaboration with, our, with my older son, John, who's not with us for this presentation but the three of us put our heads together to come up with what do students need to figure out what's in front of them? I know when I was a student, I just guessed my way through school. I guessed my way through the first few years of business, went to grad school, still trying to figure it out. And so we wanted to figure out a blueprint that would help students begin the process now. Our bios are included in this slide deck so I'm not gonna spend time going over my background or Scott's background, but they're in here if you're curious about where we come from and what we've done. But I do wanna thank Christine and Lauren for making this possible and for the great assistance of Joseph and Gio for getting a lot of this information marketed to you people. The objective of these training sessions will be to prepare you for what's coming. And I know that sounds ominous, it's not meant that way. It's meant to be instructive and helpful. But in the many years that Scott and I have trained and coached professionals, the one comment that rings the clearest is this one. I wish I had known all of this earlier in my life, so I would have done things much differently. I just didn't know. You won't be able to make this claim for when we finish these seven leadership sessions, if you attend each one, you will know you will know what's coming. 
our intent is to present to you a plan or blueprint for achieving success in school and work, which will begin to bleed over into life in general. We will not leave many questions unanswered. We want you to become successful. That's our, that's our mission here. The rest is up to you. We know this works. We've evidenced it in the thousands of professionals we have worked with over the years. I spent 20 years at Deloitte working with accounting professionals, getting them to the point of partnership. And it took a lot of work. It's a simple formula, but it is not an easy path. It requires commitment, discipline, and resolve. There will be times when you'll want to give up and you can't do that. You just have to keep pushing. Keep this in mind, the world moves so quickly. I'm 74 years old. It seemed like yesterday when I was your age. I'm here to tell you that it moves by in a heartbeat. If you don't exercise commitment, discipline, and resolve, you will find time pass by and success. In the one that I took two years of Shakespeare in college, the one quote that stands out to me is this one. I wasted time, now doth time waste me. Think about that. Okay, the, uh, the seminar sessions that we'll be facilitating over the next seven weeks, obviously tonight, navigating and the nine-year plan. Next week, next week is the backbone of everything we're going to be training you on. So if you, if you can't make any of the sessions besides this one, Make sure you go to that one. It's about becoming a strategic partner and personal credibility. This is what makes you the person you'll become to become successful. Then following those, that, that session on strategic partner and personal credibility, Scott will facilitate a session on first impressions and impact interviewing. I know it's easy to brag on your son, but I'm here to tell you that he's the best recruiter I've ever been with. He's recruited for many years. He's brought in many people. And he knows how to tell young professionals to do very well in an interview. This is where it all begins. If you can't sell yourself in an interview, everything else is for naught. So you'll be facilitating that session on the 27th. Then marketplace eminence, the networking factor. It's all about networking. You have to build a network. Keep in mind that if you have 300 people in your network, and those 300 people have, each have 300 people on their network, you're one phone call away from 90,000 people. The problem is people don't work at building their network. And then managing yourself around time, that would be the number one challenge you'll have when you get in the work world is time. You find out you have many masters, and so you don't manage time, that's an oxymoron. There's no way you manage time, it's always 24 hours. What you have to learn to do is manage yourself around the time demands and the time constraints that are out there. If you're given 15 hours to do a project, you can't get more time. It's always gonna be the 15 hours you have to figure out a way to do that. And then interpersonal engagement, that's easy for most of us. But the second part of that, oral presenting, everybody hates doing that. Even the people who are good at it will tell you this is a tough thing to do. They interviewed hundreds of people on the street, Gallup, this surveying nationally, hundreds of people on the street and asked them the question, if you had to make a presentation next week to 300 people or die, what would you choose? And people had to stop and think about it. Okay, it's not that hard, but it is psychologically, it's difficult for people to picture themselves doing oral presenting. We're gonna show you how to do that effectively. And then the last one is, once you become successful, your charge is to help other people become successful. Okay, we pulled the get together the book a number of years ago. It was endorsed by Dr. Tony Alessandra, author of The Platinum Rule and Charisma, two excellent books, and Dr. Benjamin Carson, who at the time was director of uh, pediatric surgery at, at Johns Hopkins. He's now HUD secretary. These are bios on Scott, myself, and my other son, John. 
Okay, why is this book important? What is one of America's number one concerns? Student loan debt crisis. It's already at 1.6 trillion and moving up. 620 billion more than national credit card debt. So when people are contemplating going to college, when I went to school, $18 a credit hour. I went on the GI Bill, it was easy. Now it's a killer to go to college. You have to make a total commitment. In colleges, and this is not, I'm not diminishing colleges because I believe fervently in higher education, but they actually have retention plans to keep students there longer than four years. So they have built into the system so that the average tenure for a student to be in college is six years. So you start taking six years times what you pay every year. Colleges are big business. So we need to understand that in order to navigate where you're headed. Undergrad uh, student loan debt, the average is $28,565. Over 44.5 million borrowers. So average uh, monthly payments, 200, 299. Graduate school loan debt is staggering, 82,800 average, $949 per month for payments. So having said that, you don't wanna to go to college saying, well, I'm gonna to go to college and find out who I am and what I wanna do. You wanna know where you're headed, who you are, and what you wanna do before you get there so you don't spend six years. You wanna make every moment there count. However, having talked about the cost of going to college, the, co the cost of not going to college is even greater. There's a 67% differential in earning potential between a college graduate and a high school graduate. Over a 40 year period based on a $100,000 average salary for a college grad, the earning potential is $4 million for a college grad, a million three for a high school grad. Just think what two million six would purchase over that period of time. So is it worth going to college? Yes. You just have to be smart about going to college and what you're doing there. In the, meantime, in the meantime, our broader community is crying for talent. Students and their parents deserve better. Too many students cannot find their way. High school and college academic career counselors the student ratio is one to 1,000 or worse. When I was in grad school, went to Ball State for a degree in higher education. I spent 15 minutes with my academic advisor and I asked him, 15 minutes, I've, I've got some things to sort out here. He said, I have 1,600 students that I have to see during the course of this year. I said, so mathematically, what does that work out to be? 15 minutes of each one, your time's up. So this spurred me on to say, you know, this can't be right. People are spending a lot of money to go to school and they're only getting this type of attention. And if you go to independent professional advising, it usually is very expensive. I will say to you that there is a difference in some schools and at St. X, you do have a different arrangement. And I'll let Lauren speak to it, and then Christine's going to speak to part of it as well. Go ahead, Lauren. Sure. Thank you. So uh, you heard Mr. Bagley talk about, you know, the importance of going to college and really spending time now figuring out what it is that you want rather than spending that time in college. And so really at St. X, you guys, or rather our St. X students, have a big advantage. Uh, so you heard Mr. Bagley talk about, you know, the student load for college advisors on the college side. On the high school side, specifically at St. X, we typically, as college advisors, work with about 60 to 75 seniors each. Um, and same with juniors. So max, our load is about 150 students each. And so the reason for that is because we want to spend time with our students to help them find their way. 
Uh, and so for those of you who are juniors or seniors and you've met with your college advisors already, you probably know a little bit of this. I know there are some freshmen and sophomores on the call as well. So as an introduction, I kind of want to lay out the tools that are at your disposal as St. X students. Uh, and so when you enter your junior year, you will be given access to something called U Science. It is an aptitude assessment. It's actually made up of about 10 brain games that you go through and um, it is 90 minutes max. Uh, but in the end, comes out with a really rich set of results that will identify your aptitudes and even dig down into those a little bit more, give you some language to talk about who you are um, in different parts of who you are, and will also provide you with um, a whole list of careers and career fields that would be a good fit for you, um, determined by your aptitudes and your interests. And so not only is it a list, but it actually allows you to dig down and learn more about each of those different career fields. And Ms. Dallenhauer is gonna talk in just a minute about how um, we can use the Career Connections program as kind of a step two to that U Science tool. Another tool that we have, and actually sophomores are probably taking this right now, um, they have until the end of the month to complete the Indigo assessment. And this identifies um, students' disc styles and their motivators. We kind of think of indigo as maybe what's in your heart and you science as what's in your head. And so as college advisors, we use your results from these two assessments to help identify what career fields might be best for you, as well as what types of colleges um, would best fit you in your future. Additionally, we've brought on a new tool this year that's called Corsava. It is a, cord, a card sorting exercise. It, it's pretty quick, it's maybe 10 minutes, but it allows you to identify what's important to you in your college search. So it, it asks students to think about things that maybe they haven't thought about before um, on a college campus. And so that's kind of neat because it does help you identify kind of your must-haves, nice-to-haves, um, et cetera. And so we can use that data again to help, help you find the college that's right for you. Many of our students are already using the SCORE platform. So this is the tool that we use to help students manage their college search. They can do a lot of searching in there, um, but it's how we know what schools students are considering and it's our way to suggest schools to students as well that we feel like would be a great fit for them. And finally, we have a Canvas course specifically for college advising. So within that Canvas course, you know, you have access to all of these different tools, um, but here you'll also find access for essay writing tips, um, how to pay for your college education. So you've heard Mr. Bagley talk about uh, the student loan debt issue in the country. So we want to get ahead of that and we want to work with our families on how to find ways to finance their college education. Um, so there are some resources there, but of course, working with your college advisor is best. There's information in there about ACT and SAT test prep as well. A lot of our students do that kind of test prep and we've got a whole lot of providers that our families work with in the Cincinnati area. Um, so all of those types of resources are available there and I tell everybody, you know, you can start with the Canvas course but always interface with your college advisor and we work together as your partner to manage this whole process. Great, thank you, Mrs. Cobble. Appreciate it. This is great stuff. This is Dallin Howard. Do you want to address the? Yes, I will jump in here. I'm used to calling you Bill and Lauren Lauren. So don't, let's not try to use Dallin Howard, right? <laughs> um, so no, I think most of the people, certainly students and parents, I hope 
know about the Career Connections program. Some of the alumni on the call may not because it is just three going on four years old, but the concept is really simple. It's giving students real world experiences to help them explore different career paths. So just as Lauren talked about the tools to help channel your ideas about college majors, think of Career Connections as the place to just explore um, all different careers. And it's not to try to have you kind of center in on a single one at age 14 and think of nothing else. It really is to try some different things on. And we do that through a number of different um, sub programs. So we have monthly speakers come in, talk about various careers and what their journeys have been. We've got a coaching program if you want to talk one on one, want to meet with a lawyer, want to meet with an engineer, understand what a day in a life is. We've got a job shadowing program that allows you to get out to really see it in action. You can see some of the pictures. And we also have a summer internship. And this is where you can go a bit deeper. So let's say you think you love engineering. Well, let's get you an engineering internship so that you can really spend eight weeks in that culture and in that environment. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can tap into the program. It's available for all grade levels. And we've got a Canvas page very similar to College Advising. But I am certainly at your service to just help any of the students who are trying to tap in um, to the program make sure that they find the right fit and it really is just you know seeing is believing and experiencing is really where you learn so you're gonna go armed with some of these great tools from Lauren and some great content and tools from Bill and then allow that to be your springboard to go try some things out in Career Connections. Thank so you, Chris. That, yep back to you Bill. Okay, so we realize what the problems are. How do we fix this dilemma? It's easy to point out the issues, but Scott and I, our mission again was to fix this problem. So we pulled together the book. Our charge to all the students is to read this guidebook, and it's, it's a very simple book to go through. We've compressed it. We've taken a lot of the extra rhetoric out of there to make it a real blueprint as opposed to a scholarly work. So it's, it's an easy read. The chapters are laid out in this way. First of all, you need to discover who you are. Most people say, well, I know who I am. And then they get into an interview and the recruiter will say, Gio, take the next 15 minutes and tell me about my, tell me about yourself. And then the person sits there with a blank stare like, well, I graduated from St. X High School. Wait a minute. What about the 18 years to that point that made you who you are, your values, your interests, your motivators, people who were role models for you? What about all that? Oh, yeah. So then people backtrack and start put piecing together that 18 years. What we're forcing you to do is focus on that now. Crystallize who you are. Second chapter, explore what career options might be available to you. Anyone have any idea how many career options there are out there? Thousands. People say, when I get to college, I'll figure out what I want to do for a job for my career. No, it's too hard. There's too many things going on. You have such limited time, so you need to start exploring now what career options might be available to you. Then learn how to select the right career niche for you, not for someone else, but it's for you. You have to figure it out, what matches with your values, your interests, your motivators. Then when you figure out the career niche, you, you connect a major to it. And most people go about it the wrong way. They go to college and somebody will say to them, hey, I know if you major in accounting, you can get a job when you graduate. What they don't tell you is, However, you may hate that job. You'll get a job, but it may not be aligned with who you are. So you need to make sure that when you select the, the major, it's connected to the career niche you want to find yourself in. Then you determine the right college for you. Explore the various financial options, and there are many. Better understand ACT and SAT. SAT. It's ever-changing. Several years ago when we built this book, ACT and SAT was primary. 
Now it may be there, may not be there. We don't know. Learn how to develop an admissions essay. Understand which high school courses best prepare you to act, to achieve academically once you get to college. A lot of people say, well, I, I really didn't do that well in high school, but I'll learn it in college. It's hard. It's harder to learn in college. I remember I took a Spanish class my freshman year in college. I took it in high school, but I didn't do very well. And I thought, well, he started out with yes is C. Uno, dos, tres. And I thought, oh, see, I'm going to be able to learn this. By the third week, we were conjugating seven verbs. It goes quickly. So you need, while you're in high school, prepare yourself to achieve well academically in college. Then learn what employers search for in a candidate because when you become a sophomore in college, they send scouts to the colleges to check out the students to find out which ones are going to be the best talent to bring into their organization. And Scott will help you with this piece of it. Commit to a nine year plan. And I know for high school students, this sounds like an interminable amount of time. But nine years goes by in a blink. And it catches most people by surprise. They are in their third year of their career. And they're like, when I was at Deloitte, I had a number of very bright professionals come in and see me after their third year and say to me, Bill, I hate auditing. OK, well, you spent four years in college in an extra year in grad school and you've been here three years building your career in public accounting to be an auditor and you found out now that you hate it. What do I do? So we had to do everything retroactively to help that person prepare for another career. So the nine years goes by quickly. Get on it now so that when you're in your third year of whatever career field you're in, you're going to be on the road to success. And then learn the role a mentor plays in all of this. Nobody's ever made it on their own. You'll hear people say, yeah, she's a self-made woman or he's a self-made man. There is no such thing. We all have mentors. And you need to be able to find them and use them in the right way. And people are out there happy to mentor you. Okay, other thoughts or questions you might have. Are there viable options to college? Yes, there are. Military is one. I did that. Vietnam was roaring when I was in high school. When I graduated, I went, went in the military. But when I, after I'd been in there a few weeks, I was like, wow, I'm not going to make a career out of the military. And then I was presented other options and realized I needed to go to college. When should I start the post-high school education process? Now. How important are, are effective interviewing skills? critical. What soft skills or leadership skills must I learn to succeed in a workplace environment? We're going to go over that next week. That's the backbone of our presentations. And what professional assistance might exist to help me with all these requirements and expectations? And we'll talk about that as well. Okay, chapter one, page 11 in the guidebook. And I think all of you were, were sent a an electronic copy of the guidebook, page 11. First, you must find out or understand who you are and what you want in life. Nobody can do this for you. Your parent, you may be very close to your parents. You may have an uncle who's, or an aunt who's really great, or a neighbor. They don't know you. They know you, but they don't really know you. So you have to do these things on your own. So the personal inventory, pages 11 through 15, you need to be completely candid with your responses. There is no right or wrong answer. This is about you. Your three strongest areas of interest, what are they? Nobody's going to grade you on this. This is for, you, for your edification only. Your three greatest skills, the three things you value most in life. And these things come into play in, in your career. Your three favorite courses in school. Your three least favorite courses in school. The three things people like most about you. Five people you most admire. And here's a great Cincinnati story here. I do this every year for my UC Lender Honors Plus students. I've been teaching there for 15 years. 
in the first year I gave them this inventory, I got the responses back and I asked them the three people you most admire, mother, father, grandparent. I was like, this has got to be an anomaly. I was expecting back then Michael Jordan, Def Leppard, but mother, father, grandparent. So the next year I did it. Mother, father, uncle, grandfather, grandmother. I'm like, wow. You know, this says a lot about Cincinnati. The closeness of families and the influence that families have on their children is amazing. What are their occupations? These are people you admire, so you're probably beginning to admire what they do for a living, too. Three careers you would consider upon graduating from college. The three things you hope to find in your career. And this is extremely important. If you're going to sales and you're not motivated by money, it's not going to work. Because sales is about money. But if you want satisfaction, it could be anything. Teaching, counseling, coaching. But you need to make sure that you're lining yourself up with those things that motivate you. If it is money, be honest with yourself. Say, yeah, I work every summer to make money. I know it motivates me, so I'm going to find a career where that money is a payoff. And there'll be other, I hired somebody at Deloitte years ago. He was a top student coming out of Xavier. And after his first year, he came in to talk to me and he said, I'm not finding any satisfaction here. I said, well, let's go through an interest inventory. And I said, if, if, you, if I could pay you 100000 a year and you had to work 50 hours a week, what would you do? He said, I work for the Peace Corps. I said, you're working for Deloitte. I said, yeah. I said you're at far end of the spectrum from Peace Corps. He said, I know it. And I don't know what to do about it because I, I really want to be successful in a business career. So we worked it out that his avocation was more around Habitat for Humanity so that he was finding an outlet for his interest. And he still made a lot of money, but that money wasn't important to him. I said, well, give it to the Peace Corps, which he does. Three things you want to avoid in your career, extremely important, time pressures, excessive travel, limited growth. You work for a firm like Deloitte or PwC or Procter & Gamble and you don't like to travel? It's going to be a tough life. Some of your achievements to date. And then defining success, please provide in this space your definition of the term success. When you visualize in your mind's eye what you perceive to be a successful individual, what do you see? Crystallize this, because this is, this is who you want to be. When you start filling this out, th this is the person that you aspire to be. And then why do people work? List three basic reasons in your opinion why people spend at least 33% of their adult life prior to retirement at their place of work. Primary motivators of working people. Rank them according to your order of importance. Dream sheeting. Now that you've worked through all that, when I was in the military, they when we got out of boot camp, they sent our paper around. They said, you get to dream sheet here for what you want to do. So we put down our three choices. I didn't get any of them. But it was fun going through, this is what I'd really like to do. But in this situation, you do have a choice. So if you could name your salary or if salary was not an important factor in your decision, what jobs would be most appealing to you? If cost wasn't a factor and you could attend any university or vocational school, which ones would you select and why? If you could select any academic area based on your personal interest, what are three college or vocational majors you would pursue? Okay, when you get through this exercise, you'll know who you are in an interview. Somebody says, Joseph, tell me, take the next 15 minutes and tell me about yourself they'll have to tell you to stop because you're gonna have a lot of information to share with them. And then chapter two on page 16, these are career options that are available to you, thousands of them. We narrowed it down just so people wouldn't lose their mind trying to go through everything, but 
in this chapter, this is a sampling of field, of career field options. And these are a few. And from this branch out hundreds of others. Business management could be any of these areas. You're not gonna know what they are. Somebody said to you, you know, tell me about human resources. You're probably not, you have a general idea about human resources, but this is where you start exploring. Or you meet with Mrs. Cobble and say, I need to find out about these careers. I know you have, I know you have some resources here for me that will help me understand these better. And then you go to Mrs. D and she'll say, I'm gonna put you in a career shadowing situation here. You think you might be interested in marketing? I'm gonna have you spend three days with somebody in marketing. That's why these resources are so important and you need to take advantage of them. The vast majority of high schools, they haven't even touched on this. Social services, you know, if you're a person that has a lot of empathy and you wanna get satisfaction in helping people, this is the area you might wanna go into. Then you get to chapter three, and this is mapping interests, skills, values, strengths, and motivators that you have determined for yourself to preferred career options, and this is on page 25. Okay, you're beginning to get into the, the, the grind of this, locating a career niche. You need to center down on various career options and then take it a step further in focusing on a viable job. So borrowing from Collins' book, Good to Great, he, in his book, he has a hedgehog concept that's designed for businesses to help them determine what business area they should be in. We borrowed it to apply it to finding career and job options. You need to look at your interests, your strengths and skills, your values and motivators, and to center down on career options. And there, there again, Mrs. Cobble can help you with this process. Then the second part is, okay, I'm looking at career options. I have 10 of them here. I'm, pretty interested in what is available out there that matches my skills, values, and interest base. You may have career options, but there may be jobs in that particular career option that aren't available. So right now, restaurant work, obviously, because of COVID, shut down. If you want to go into restaurant work, she would say to you, no, that's not where you need to spend your time. You find a place that matches your skills, values, and interest base. Can I be passionate about this or is this just a job? The people that I talked to at Deloitte that hated auditing, the career options were there, the viable job, they got a job immediately and got paid a lot of money. But were they passionate about it? No, so it didn't work. Okay, Stephen Covey is one of my heroes, talked about Begin with the end in mind. Before you do anything, don't think about the beginning. Think about the end. Where, where, do, you, where do I want to be in five years or 10 years? And like I said before, it goes by in a blink. So figure out where, where, do I, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Then learn the career options available to you. Complete the personal inventory and goal setting exercises and complete the career mapping exercise. So the personal mission statement is, where do you see yourself in 10 years? The college you, you're going to go to, graduate school, you're going to go to vocational school. What type of profession or job are you going to have? What is your income going to be? You know, one thing about human beings, it's not achieving goals that holds them back. It's establishing goals. People don't set goals. They just go in with the herd and have people push them through it. They're like, well, I'm not even sure where I'm headed. So figure out what, what income do I want 10 years from now? What kind of home? What location do I want to be in? What kind of car? How about family size? So these are all things that are going to happen to you. So you need to be on top of it so you can help plan it through. Now, you can't control everything. I've tried that. You can't control everything. But you can have some control over your destiny. 
We'll talk about Dr. Edward Banfield's career destination theory next week. But one piece of it is that every day, the people who are successful, every day they either go to bed or get up in the morning and they think about what am I going to do today to get me to where I want to be in the future. They don't leave it for chance. They don't feel like, well, my boss will tell me where I'm going to be headed or what I'm going to be doing or what I'm going to be making. You, you determine that. And then you take a long time perspective, Brian Tracy, who was one of the endorsers of our book, authored a book called goals. And he talks about, you know, put aside immediate gratification things like I want to have the fastest car or the biggest house or the finest clothes, put those things aside. You don't need to go to every, or watch every football game on TV, put some of those things back and think, you know, my number one priority is to get me to where I want to go. So some of these other things that are seem important, I got to put them aside so that I can get to where I want to be. So today you are here at the big star, pick your career field. Eventually you get a specific job and then you'll get another job maybe in the same career field, maybe not. It doesn't happen anymore where you get a job and you stay there for 45 years and they give you a gold watch and you retire. It doesn't work that way anymore. So you may have one or two or three jobs, but you'll always be getting jobs that are in the area of interest for you where you can be successful. And then you hit your ultimate role. You want to match with a career field that reflects your education, your goals, your values, your interests, your skills, and yes, your vision. You know, businesses have vision. There's not a successful business out there that doesn't have a vision. You're your own business. What is my vision? Where do I want to be? And it's amazing what you can achieve when you develop a vision and you get prepared for what's in front of you. Then you go through the career mapping exercise. All the information you took from your personal inventory exercise crystallized on these pages here. So you see this person is beginning to narrow where they're headed. Occupation of successful person in your mind, and this person's mind was coach or leadership trainer. Well, yeah. why do people work? In order to survive in a capitalistic society? Yeah. To positively impact the world, it says a lot about your values, internal satisfaction. That's your selfish interest. It's okay. Your top three primary motivators, quality of people within an organization, personal satisfaction, and salary. Okay, based on earlier responses, this person's been able to develop 10 relevant career options. It's still a wide field. Human resources, recruiting, sales, corporate training, personal development training, counseling psychology. One thing's wonderful about America, there's a million opportunities out there for you, for you to do things. College administration, athletic coach, being in the military, crisis intervention, and all those are all the academic majors lined up next to those career options. Dream sheeting, to get to the point now, okay, I can't wait. I'm gonna put down what I really wanna do. So coach, personal development trainer, student personnel administration. Perfect college for you and why. I was gonna put Michigan down here because of their football program, but sorry. Couldn't resist that. So for this person, Indiana, Notre Dame, University of South Carolina, University of Cincinnati, Xavier, for a lot of different reasons. Perfect major, history, because I enjoy it, organizational communication, combines my interest and skills, human resource management, ideal business preparation. And then the person moves forward into selecting their academic major, their school and academic major. Okay, mapping preferred career options to an academic major or vocational curriculum. There are a lot of academic majors out there as well. And sometimes colleges are not that helpful in you selecting the major. It's got to be up to you. 
So accounting major prepares accountants and auditors, financial managers, CPAs, consultants, business advisors. And I know I'm biased. I'm not an accountant. I major in history. I got a graduate degree in higher education. But for people who want to go into business, getting an accounting degree is paramount. I mean, it's, it prepares you for anything you want to do in the business world. But for some people, it's like, man, too dry. So think about those things. Don't do it because it'll get you a job. Do it because it will lead to something you'll enjoy. Biology, epidemiology right now because of the COVID, that's one of the top areas. So if somebody likes biology, there are a lot of opportunities out there. Okay, chapter five, selecting a college or a vocational school. It's on page 45. Read the following books. These are for the parents primarily. Is College Worth It? By William J. Bennett, former Secretary of Education. He provides both sides of the argument, and it's worth reading. And then Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course and Getting His Kid Into College. It's a humorous look at this process, which is time-consuming and costly, but it's a pretty good primer on how to do it the right way. Hey, Bill, can I just jump in really quickly? Sure. Um, we actually, in the College Advising Office, we're working with um, some authors who have recently written books about the college admission process, and we are seeing what we can do to try and get them to present to our families. So um, that's a little bit of a teaser, but our families should stay tuned because there may be more coming out about that soon. Perfect. Everybody needs help with this one. Okay, finding the perfect college or training form for you. Keep in mind, it's not about the college, university, or vocational school. It's about the individual. It's about you. Now, I went, I, I was in the military first. I was introduced to college through Operation Bootstrap, which through the, was through the University of Maryland. And a couple of NCOs who said to me, Bagley, you need to go to college. So I thought, well, I'm going to take a few classes to see where it leads me. And I ended, when I got out of the military, I went to Indiana University regional campuses, one in my hometown, because by then I was married and had two little boys, Scott being one of them. So I couldn't afford to go to college. I went to a regional campus and Earlham College, which was a small college in my hometown. And I got three years behind me between Operation Bootstrap and regional campus. Had some fine professors there. Then I went to Indi Indianapolis to IUPUI and got my final degree. And I had to take a couple classes from Blooming the Bloomington campus. But people said to me, oh, you, you, need, to, you need to go to the main campus. You're, you know, going to regional campus is not going to prepare you. It prepared me. And I went on and got my graduate degree. And I had a number of people through the years that came to me for advice that had graduated from Harvard, Brigham Young. It doesn't matter when you get into a job and you've performed well, you know, if, if you're a person that wasn't able to go to the best school, it's okay. Just make the most out of where you are going. Okay, I'm gonna jump in again there too. Okay. I'm so glad you made that point because we talk to students about the same types of things. Make the most of your time in college. We definitely have students who are looking at um, in highly selective schools where they're going to spend all of their time, you know, working on their academic work and kind of keeping up with their classwork, but then they may be sacrificing time that they could have spent doing research or an internship or getting involved in clubs or having leadership positions on campus. So it's certainly, you know, the student's decision where they go, but I'm, um, I'm glad you're, you're reinforcing what, we're, what we tell our students as well as um, really making the most of your time, getting involved in those other things to build out kind of your whole portfolio um, will be important regardless of where you go to school. Yeah, good point. I mean, a lot of students become physically ill because they're trying to reach somebody else's uh, goal. And there are opportunities out there. You get your degree and you do all the leadership strategic partner things that 
Scott and I will be teaching, you'll be successful. There is a variety of criteria to be considered when selecting a college, and it's hard. But here's a list of them, cost, location, campus aesthetics, enrollment size, et cetera, et cetera. I know all of you have been through this, so it can drive you crazy trying to figure out what I really want to do, where do I want to be. I would say of all those, the two most important, Proactive Career Services and Placement Department. There was a time when you went to college to become enlightened. You went to a higher education institution to become smart in the liberal arts. But a recent survey by Gallup talking to parents, 97% of them said, my, my child's going to college because I want them to get a job. So if you go to a college and they don't have a proactive career services and placement department, it's pretty hard for you to hook up with employers. You're getting the opportunity at St. X, but you could go to a college where they don't do that and they don't have employers coming on campus to interview you. Hard to get a job if you don't have people interviewing you. Heavy recruiting of seniors by employers, that's a criteria you wanna make sure you're looking at. Okay, what financial options are available? Page 49. Approximately $237 billion in student aid available to students each year. 13,200 available to undergrads per year from various sources. Each year, much of it is left on the table because people don't know. They haven't been advised. I'm assuming Mrs. Cobble, Mrs. D advises students at St. X, but a lot of kids go to college, they have no idea what financial options are out there for them. If you make a mistake on a FAFSA form, they turn it down. And you may not even find out about it until you've been rejected. Chapter seven, what about the ACT, SAT, and the admissions essay? Many colleges currently require one or the other. Select colleges make determinations specific to the scores. Most scholarships are contingent on scoring, but many institutions are considering dropping the tests. Admissions essays, though, I would say are critical. And we provided guidelines in the navigating guidebook on how to construct an effective one. Yeah, and I will just pop in to say that this pandemic has really changed the way colleges are looking at standardized tests. Um, more and more are choosing to go the test optional route. Um, but many are sticking with their test required policy. And honestly, you know, it, it's going to probably change from one year to the next. Um, so our students, all the same next students do take the ACT in school in March, and many are just proceeding as if they're going to need the test, yeah. you know, and you can make the decision later if you want to use the test in a test optional admission application. Um, but it is, you know, a big part of the admission application and certainly a conversation you can have with your college advisor if you want to find out the best way to prepare for that, too. Good point. Chapter eight, first things first, preparing for post high school education, page 55. And my thought on that is you need to start preparing now. These are key skill areas when you get into business. Now, everything or not business, but in your career. Any professional field that you enter, you're going to be expected to write effectively, do oral presentations. And I know most of you are saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing oral presentations. When I was at Deloitte, we had a audit manager who was on his way out to meet with a partner, with a client, with a partner. The partner was driving the car. The audit manager was riding with him and they were going to make a key presentation to the client. And the audit manager said to the partner, are you ready for the presentation? He said, I don't know, are you? You're giving it today. He's like, what? Said, yep, you gotta learn sometime. Now that was unfair to him, but he said, after you make a lot of mistakes today, the client knows you're doing the presentation and I'm gonna help you fix how you do an oral presentation. So you don't want to wait until you get into a situation where you could fail. You want to make sure that you're focusing on oral presentation. When I went to 
college, they, or, they offered one mandated, one speech class. So everybody pushed it back to the spring semester of their senior year, hoping that this college would drop it from the curriculum. If I had to do over again, I would have taken an every, I would have taken a speech class every semester. But this is the one area, oral presentation, that will separate you from the larger group. People who are successful in life are doing things that the vast majority of other people don't want to do. And oral presenting is one of them. So writing, oral presentation, research, logic, basic math, and technology are key skill areas in the work world today. Courses of importance, English composition. It saved me when I got to college. I was, for some, God bless me around being good in English composition. It just came easy to me. I got to college, it's what kept me there. But a lot of people struggle. So make sure you're doing a good job in English comp, speech and communications, history, History is all about forming leaders. You read about the success and failure of leaders. So if you want to be a leader, you have to take history. Psychology, literature, logic, religion, philosophy, and ethics, business math, algebra, and accounting. Chapter nine, what do employers look for in co-op intern and full-time employees? And Scott will get into this on his presentation on the 27th. They're looking for, I'd like to, this is where I'd like to be in front of a group so I can ask the question. And I ask students, I'll say, when, when you're interviewing for a job, who, who do you think the recruiter's comparing you against? And the most students will say, the other students? No. They're comparing you against the sharpest people in their organization, the best people. Because recruiters get paid for bringing in talent. High talent, strong talent. People are going to be successful. Mrs. D knows when she went to PwC, I mean, the recruiting process is rigorous. They take only the best. So they look for strategic partners, positive self-image, executive presence, strong interpersonal skills, being aware of the world around them, professionalism, relationship building skills, persuasive presentation style, networkers, and leaders of others. And this is what we'll cover next week. <clears throat> Excuse me, first impression forms. When you go to college, there's gonna be all around you. Meet the firm's night, career fairs, scholastic fraternity events, business fraternity events, sorority events, on and on and on. You're gonna be on display. And people are there not to have fun conversations with you. They're there to select you to work for their organization. And this is where you need to show them I'm a strategic partner. <coughs> Sorry. It's all about perception. Because perception becomes reality in the eyes of those forming and holding that image. They can't help it. If they have a capability, if they have observation capability, when they meet you, they're going to make judgment about you. It just happens. So you want to make sure it's a positive judgment. Okay, chapter 10 is designing go forward plan, the nine year plan. And it's in there for you to take a look at. I'm gonna go through it briefly, but you can take a close look at it at some point. A dream deserves a plan. In fact, it requires a plan for it to become a reality. So for the next nine years, you need to think about, okay, I'm here now finish high school, I'm gonna get my college degree, and in my third year in my career, where am I gonna be? The nine-year plan's initiated, hopefully now. You'll complete it at some point in this career destination arc, and then you'll become a strategic partner. But you've gotta lay the foundation. Strategic partner's hard. I mean, it's just not a term that somebody achieves by checking the boxes. You gotta really work it. Keep in mind that organizations have four goals. The first and primary is to grow the business. And how do they do that with strategic partners? This is central to leadership. 
that's central to the human resource people, the people who will be meeting you on campus, is to bring in top talent. This is central to their job. This is what they get paid for. Central to the coaching focus, the mentors within the organization cultivate personal and professional skills of the individual to create the strategic partners. The fourth goal, this one's central to you, to enhance your individual value and personal marketability. This is the one, this is the goal you'll be focusing on. And I can either get the satisfaction, enhance my individual value and enhance my personal marketability in the organization, or I'll do it so well that if they don't recognize it, I can go somewhere else. Okay, the plan. I've got an outline here. Junior year, you need to read the Navigating Toward Academic and Career Sex Success Guidebook. Complete the following within the guidebook. Personal inventory, career mapping, academic major mapping, selecting a college, FAFSA form, ACT, SAT exam if it applies, admissions essay, self-assessment exercise, and goal setting exercise. Again, humans' problems are not achieving goals, they're setting goals. People just don't set them. Okay, for the next nine years, review your top three goals and hold yourself accountable for moving toward achievement. You achieve one goal, you move it off the sheet and you add another one. Strong interest inventory assesses interest or whatever Mrs. Cobble has for you to take to assess interest. Then you begin researching career areas of interest now and when you're in first few years of college, primary recruiting contact, reputation of company, financial health of the company, requ request informational brochure, recruiting literature, internship opportunities. Now you're getting those opportunities now in high school. Most students have to wait till they get into college before they start this. Okay, focus on a 3.5 GPA or better, 3.0 minimum. When I was at Deloitte, when I first went there, the rule was don't interview anybody for a job lower than a 3.5 grade point average. And I went back to the partners and I said, man, we're missing a lot of really good talent. You know, there are people in there with a 3.2 or 3.3 that could be partners in here. So we've eventually lowered it 3.0. So you, that's the threshold. Elective classes you should consider taking Select a mentor to assist you going forward now, your first year in college and your first year on the job. Make sure you have a mentor. Design a network list and update it each week. Look into whether your campus or your employer offers a Toastmasters chapter. That's all about oral presentation. If they don't have one, organize one. It's a non-hostile environment for you to practice. You'd be a regular participant in Toastmasters. It takes about nine years for somebody to become an expert in presenting. Work on improving your research and writing skills. Become involved in extracurricular activities. Doesn't matter which ones. Just be involved in something. Read one book or listen to one CD or DVD per month. By the end of the nine-year plan, you will have done 108 of them being the top 5% of people in America. Focus on your personal presence and how to enhance how you appear. Meet with your academic advisor, career counselor, or mentor to discuss your career interests. Review the Impact Interviewing Guidebook, which is a guidebook that I authored a number of years ago and which I'll get an electronic copy to you on. You need to review that. Scott will go over that, his presentation in a couple of weeks. Learn one new word per week. One new word per week is easy. At the end of nine years, 468 new words, plus a, a group of five or six that you will each week that will attach to that word. And you will be in the top 1% of people in America if you learn 468 new words. One of the problems with college graduates today is they're being interviewed and recruited by people 
who have a much stronger vocabulary than they do. Because each year, schools dumb down the requirement around vocabulary. Begin, continue your fitness program at least two days per week. Apply for a part-time job, internship, co-op, or line up a summer job. Even if you get a full-ride scholarship to college, the recruiter is going to ask you, did you work while you're in school? They want to know that you worked. Work ethic is one of the number one attributes of a successful person. Assume responsibility for a portion of your college costs. Even if you've got a academic scholarship, you still want to help support, and you'll be asked that in the interview too. Did you help with your college expenses? Read current events, 30 minutes per day. Enroll in a music appreciation class. Enroll in an art appreciation class. Play golf if you're not a golfer, take lessons. And then people best is an assessment to assess his behaviors, it's helpful. I say music appreciation, art appreciation, golf. When you get into business and you're going to dinner with someone, they talk about other things than what you're doing every day. So you want to make sure that you're in recurrent events, that you're well-rounded, that you know about everything that's going on. You don't have to be an expert, but at least you have an appreciation. Okay, here's a suggested reading, listening, viewing list. You don't have to read all these, but these are ones that I've read that I'm very high on. Grit by, uh, can't remember, for Angela Duckworth is one of the best about how people become successful. She studied West Point graduates who failed and said because they don't have grit. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Three books in here, The Tipping Point, Outliers and Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. He's one of the great thinkers of our time. Lead the Field series, How to Work a Room. These are all great books. Take one a week, Three easy reads. These will give you the basis for how to be successful in a career. Nine years, you got them all done. Some outstanding movies to read. Winston Churchill, The Fog of War about Vietnam. You need to know these things, what formed people in our society. Warm Springs about Franklin Roosevelt and his polio issue. Mississippi Burning, Race Relations in the South. Anyway, a lot of good reading material here. Some people don't like to read. Force yourself to do this. This is, this is your continuing education. Chapter 11, page 66. Select a mentor to coach you going, going forward. Critical. You need to have this person to lean on. It could be a parent, a guardian, teacher, college or company career counselor. There's always people out there who want to help. Keep this in mind. Anyone who has made it had a mentor. And the, I'm not going to read this to you, but this is a good final thought. Read through this when you get an opportunity, and this shows you that whatever a mind can think about, they can achieve it if they really commit themselves to it. The end. <laughs> I appreciate your attention. I guess everybody's still there, right? Any, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, that was fantastic, Bill. I, um, I can't thank you enough. I know you condensed a lot um, to take what is a college class and cram at least the kickoff session into those first um, 60 minutes. So yeah, we have just a couple minutes here. Um, I'll open the floor if folks want to unmute themselves. We've got a couple minutes for Q&A. And there is one logistics item I want to cover with folks. I'm going to send everyone a chat. If you haven't registered, we just wanted to have you register via the link just for this one class. All of the future sessions are optional. But if you get yourself registered, you'll be on our email mailing list then. So I'm going to send that through in the chat. And then let's go ahead and open up the floor for questions.
Mr. Bagley or uh, Mrs. Downauer, I just have one question. So we have the uh, PDF that we got through your email, you know, inviting us to the conference and stuff. And then we have this PowerPoint here. There's a lot of information on the um, PowerPoint that's not in the PDF, like uh, the full list of books and movies and stuff. Are we going to have access? I'm yes. sorry. I'm sorry, Zach, you're breaking up a little bit for me. I, I think the gist, though, Bill, was yes, I can definitely share the PowerPoint deck. So oh, I'll send sure. that out to everybody who's registered on, on, on this um, form. So yeah, Zach, don't worry about it. You'll get the slides, too. Get the slides and uh, a full copy of the electronic copy of the book. Should have all that. And anything else you might need, you can make a request through Mrs. Cobble or Mrs. D and, and they'll let me know and I'll get information to you. Thanks for that, Zach. Thanks any for other, asking for that. Yeah, any other questions from the audience? Anyone else have a question? Feel free to go off mute. Even co just a comment. Keep in mind that interpersonal engagement is one of the number one attributes <laughs> in a leader. Hard to speak up sometimes, but it's important. Uh, Bill, this is yeah. Uh, Bill, this is this is Michael Verdeer. Um, I'm not a student. I'm I'm kind of a seasoned person. I'm 55 years old. I'm an engineer by background. I own my own business. I think it's pretty doggone successful. Um, you mentioned early on in the in the presentation it's something that really struck a chord with me, and it was about credibility. And I know um, in business, uh, credibility and trust is 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 paramount in what I do. Um, in a world where everybody wants a contract, uh, we still have to get contracts in place. I'm you know we're we're, we're a design construction firm. Um, around Cincinnati, the East Coast, the relationships that I've had and the people that I know and know me, I get so much work done on a phone call and a handshake. Yeah. So the credibility and the trust is, uh, is extremely important and, and I, I don't think it can be emphasized enough uh, when doing business. Um, you know, I agree. So I, I just want to share that. You, you mentioned that early on about credibility, and, and I just think it goes so far. I mean, when I'm driving from meeting to meeting or traveling, I can pick up the phone, call other consultants, ask them to do something for me. They know they're going to eventually get paid, and it's because of the trust and the credibility that we've established over the years of doing business together. That's a great point. You say it's Michael? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great point. It, it's, it's all about credibility. You know, in Cincinnati, you you find so much of that. Uh, people will ask me, Bill, we do business with you. Do you have a written contract or do you do it just by trust? And I said, I'll do it either way. You know, if you feel like yeah. you need a contract, I'll do it. But if not, I'm, I'm fine doing it without one. And we, we do most of our work without a contract. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that point. Thank you. Yeah. And then just one last thing you mentioned about, uh, you know, students, some of the things that they're looking for at the university level when they're trying to select a school. Uh, we, we, we recruit and hire uh, architects, engineers. I will say, uh, when I see a student coming from a university that's had a co-op program and has gone through a couple co-op cycles, um, that, that resume percolates to the top. I will just tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I know that's been the... Uh, been the success of UC's engineering program. They started that co-op program years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it stand it, it, it stood the sands of time. And uh, some great students come out of there. And I went to Ball State grad school, and their architecture school is the same way. Yeah, um, the co-op program is so important. Yeah, appreciate you saying that. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your time tonight. I like your beard too. Oh, thank you. That's a great beard. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it.
Well, we're we're uh, we're going to be doing a strategic partner and personal credibility next week. As as I said before, this is the backbone of everything that will go on when you get into a career. So I do hope a number of the students and parents can make this one and alums. But I've, been, I've enjoyed presenting in front of everybody, even though I couldn't be there live. I will soon. <laughs> <laughs>